Good morning. I hope you are well and that you are all continuing to survive under the difficult situations in which we all find ourselves at this present time in Scotland. I know it's been a difficult few weeks and I know there are a few more weeks to come, but I pray that you are managing to survive each day and to enjoy each day as families together. Let's take a few moments of quiet to prepare ourselves for the worship of God. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Imaginative God, you smiled and the sun burst through the shadows of chaos. You laughed and all that is good and beautiful was given shape by you. Laughing Jesus, you released us by your love, howling with laughter at death's foolish belief that the tomb could hold on to you. You burst forth into the kingdom as the stars peeled with joy. Spirit of Easter, as you fill us with new life, may we delight in sharing it with others as you tell us the good news, which can never be taken from us. May we rejoice in offering it to others, to the broken, the sad and the lonely. Forgive us, O God, and make us open to the startling and upside-down ways in which you work. Fill us with Easter's laughter. Fill us with your healing joy. Fill us with the love poured into us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. God in community, holy and one, our hearts overflow with wonder. And so we join in the words that you taught us to pray as one family saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever. Amen. Our Gospel reading this morning comes from the Gospel again from St John, reading from chapter 20 beginning at verse 18 and reading through to verse 29. That's John chapter 20, beginning at verse 18. Listen now, for God speaks to us in the scriptures. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed in them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails in his side, I will not believe. A week later, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? 
Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Friends, let us pray together. May the words of my mouth, the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts, be fitting unto you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I have to be honest and say our reading this morning is one that annoys me. It's one that sadly, I think, has created one of the poorest dialectics within our wider culture. For after all, this story concerning Thomas is one that is heard so often in our churches and beyond, and the incident has become one that is set to define him. The sad consequence of this encounter is that there has been a suspicion of doubt within our churches ever since. That suspicion has led to the understanding that doubts are the very opposite of faith. And that processing or having any doubts means that you cannot remain a disciple of Jesus. That is poor thinking. And such poor thinking is one of the worst understandings that we need to distinguish, challenge and remove from our wider understanding and faith. For friends, I believe doubt is very much a part of our journey of faith. It's as much a part of faith as his prayer, as his regular church attendance, and as his seeking to serve others in love and mercy. Furthermore, I think we need to look serious at this passage in order to begin to demythologise the silly misunderstanding that is associated with Thomas. You see, our Bibles tend to separate our passage this morning away from the ending of the previous passage, which is the story of Jesus speaking to Mary at the tomb. But I think that our passage is completely linked with that resurrection encounter between Jesus and Mary. For I think that is why I wanted to start with the words I did this morning. You see, after encountering the risen Lord, Mary Magdalene returns and tells the disciples all that she has experienced, doing exactly what Jesus has told her to do. She says, I have seen the Lord. Now we all know, friends, that this is a cry that the woman made after visiting the tomb in the early days, and it was initially very sceptically received by all the male disciples of Jesus. Our reading goes on to say that on the very same evening of Mary's great claim to having seen Jesus, the disciples are gathered and into their midst comes Jesus himself. He shows them his wounds, he offers them peace and he bestows God's spirit upon them for all that is to come in their future. Now Thomas isn't present at that meeting. And when finally he returns, he is greeted with a similar cry to that which he received from Mary in the the morning. The disciples this time say to him, we have seen the Lord. Now Thomas's response is exactly the same response of the disciples to what Mary said to them earlier in the day. He refuses to believe unless he has the same experience as them. For me, his demands to see Jesus and to touch his wounds are not cries of one who doubts, but rather they're cries of one who feels outside the wider community. He feels left out and he desires the same experience as all those who are gathered before him, all those whom he has spent several years travelling with, living with and loving. So when finally in the following week, Jesus returns and confronts Thomas with himself. The response that Thomas makes is not the response of somebody who doubts. They are the most profound words of belief issued by any who see the risen Lord in all the scriptures. My Lord and my God, he says. 
In fact, in the text, it's not even clear if he bothers to touch the wounds or see them. For me, this narrative is more about the need to be part of the community of those who believe. Thomas's story for me is about the difficulty we can all experience from being one who's left outside the buzz of the wider community. The feeling of being left out is one of the most painful and I believe most inhuman experiences within our being. I'm sure all of you can think of times where you have left out and from what was really going on or times when you have been excluded from part of a wider community that you're normally members within. The truth about all of us, friends, is that we are people who need community so much in our lives. As people, we are a species who flourish as a result of our social interactions and the support of those who love us. Such a need to belong belongs to begins to explain exactly right now the profound effects that the recent lockdown is having within our society. In a recent poll reported on the the news this week, it was clear that many people are experiencing depression and fear and isolation as a result of not being able to get out and be with their friends and their loved ones. It's this alienation and exclusion that I think which is really at the heart of our passage this morning. Thomas wants to be included in those who have seen Jesus. His demands are not about failing to believe the others. They are more about being one with those who have had the experience of seeing the risen Lord. Therefore, as those who seek to follow Jesus today, I think the challenge for all of us in our church is to think about how we might include others within our wider community. How might we welcome those who feel possibly on the fringe of our churches? How might we, in the future, improve the means by which we are connecting with people and seeking to include them? Friends, as we seek to take time to answer these difficult questions in the years ahead, I hope we can remember the story of Thomas in A New Light, For thus will there be glory to the Creator, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and forever shall be. Amen. We're going to close our reflection this morning with some further prayers for our world. We're going to use our response as is our normal practice. I will say the words, open our eyes, O God. We long to see you. And you just have to reply. I say, open your eyes, O God. And you reply, we long to see you. That's simply, open our eyes, O God. And you reply, we long to see you. Let us pray together. Loving God, as we wonder at your resurrection, at the hope you have given us, We remember the appearances you made to those who were close to you. And we pray that our eyes too may be opened to your presence. Open our eyes, O God. We long to see you. We think of Thomas so fearful of being left out. Yet you recognised his need to be reassured by your presence. As a result, we offer you our concerns for our world. Sometimes it is hard to see your presence in events that unfold. Comfort us that we may be brave at this time. At this time when so many are isolated and alone and fearful. Whether they are in hospital, whether they are working to care for those who are elderly, whether they are families worried about loved ones who are in hospital. Open our eyes, O God. We long to see you. We think, O God, today of the woman who went to your tomb 
so sad and wanting to be near you, even in their disillusionment. You appear to them in the form of angels, proclaiming the good news of your resurrection. And the women, full of joy, rush back to tell the good news. We offer ourselves and ask for your reassurance to help us reach out to the communities in which we live and work. We pray that we will make a difference to other people's lives by sharing all that you have given us, that through grace, lives may be changed by your presence. Open our eyes, O God. We long to see you. We think of Mary who loved you so much and who took such risks to be close to you. We think of how you recognised her need to see you, how you wiped away her tears simply by speaking her name. We name before you those who we to be in this special need at this time, especially those who are sick, those who are lonely, and those who may have recently been bereaved. In particular, we think of the family of Margaret Campbell, who passed away recently. Open our eyes, O oh God. We long to see you. And in the silence now of our homes, we remember those prayers that mean most to each and every one of us on this day. Open our eyes, O oh God. We long to see you. We thank you, O oh God, for your presence with us now and always. Amen. And now may you go in God's name and the blessing of the Creator, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you all and all whom you love, this day and forevermore. Amen.